My name is Mike Aben and welcome to my KSP campaign. What you see here is the Columbia, my space shuttle, and this is a vessel you've seen a number of times before, so I thought we would watch this launch from uh, the inside view this time. And while we're on our ascent, I'll talk about what is coming up in this episode. Streaking towards Kerbin right now, we have two vessels. One is the RMD, which is latched onto a D-class asteroid on its way for an aerobraking maneuver in order for us to get our capture around Kerbin. We'll later have to shuffle this uh, asteroid over to Minmus, but that will be something for uh, the future. We'll worry about it then. Right now, it's just going to be about uh, getting that capture. Also streaking into space near Kerbin is the Korion 1, which at the conclusion of last episode had completed its rescue of four Kerbals that were stranded in orbit around Minmus. Um, and now I have a total of six Kerbals coming back, along with a Mark II cockpit that was recovered from Minmus' surface as part of a uh, rescue mission as well. Oh, we are coming to booster separation. There we go. Okay, and why don't we take a look around this cockpit? Uh, I love, like, raster crop monitors and ads on all these wonderful screens. I got some cameras. Oh, there's Bill. Oh, Bill. It's not so bad. Bill, of course, is our engineer and co-pilot, and in the pilot seat we have Stala! <laughs> anyway, I'll talk about what this mission is in just a little bit. Why don't I keep talking about the Korion 1? Like I said, the Korion 1 is coming back with its six rescue Kerbals and a Mark II cockpit. And we need to uh, get those folks back to Kerbin Station in low Kerbin orbit. And we need to get them down to the surface from the Korion 1 cannot descend. And I have a new vehicle for that. And in fact, I think that vehicle will really be the highlight of this particular episode. Um, and that will be coming towards the end of the episode. I'll have a new vehicle for getting from Kerbin surface to low Kerbin orbit. Um, I don't know if I'll be retiring my old Kuryus. It's a pretty dependable vehicle. Maybe I'll go back and forth between the two, but uh, I'll save that for later. I think enough has been said about that right now. In the meantime, the Columbia has now achieved low Kerbin orbit, so it's time for us to get rid of our liquid fuel booster. There we go. I have two screens uh, on the bottom right of your screen that are actually on the fuselage. Let's nudge away a little bit. You can see the liquid fuel booster drifting away. And the screen sort of between those two and a little bit above them actually is looking at our cargo, which we'll look at in just a little bit. There we go. You can get a nice view of our liquid fuel booster drifting away here let's rotate this thing i have to rotate it so that uh the solar panel will be properly exposed usually i orient it so that the oh i'm upside down <laughs> usually i orient it so that the top is going north and then we can deploy our solar panel and uh once we are on the day side we'll be able to catch some rays we'll open up the cargo bay doors and get ready to release our payload, which I'll say right off the bat, it's nothing too special. But well, actually, one thing I did do a little bit different, I'll talk a little bit about the booster. Um, Long-time viewers might recall that I've been dropping boosters with my periapsis at around 50 kilometers. I went through all the reasoning behind that, but it all had to do with recovering it. Um, I've gone simpler now. Uh, I am actually in low Kerbin orbit, but what I did is just sneak a pro body and a couple of batteries onto this booster so that I can still control it for a little while. So I'm just going to point it retrograde. We'll arm all of these parachutes. And then we'll just uh, burn in a retrograde di direction and just deorbit this thing right now. And then we'll let stage recovery, we'll recover it. And there we go, that's it. And now we can go back to our space shuttle. And we'll take a look at the cargo here. Uh, this is JunkSat N plus one. Um, and the mission's really simple. It's a mission that I botched now a couple of times <laughs> is to put a satellite into orbit around the moon. And it's not that the mission itself was particularly complicated. It was 
I was finding different ways in which to mess it up. So this is my third attempt at putting a satellite around on the moon. This is built on the cheap. It's just got a little bit of monopropellant and some RCS thrusters in the back. And uh, you might recall as well that I have called this before JunkSat M plus one. So this is, I'm not changing the name. I am staying with the Soviet Luna tradition of when you fail missions, you pretend they didn't happen and just name the next one the same thing. So anyway, it is on its way. We will obviously uh, set up an insertion burn and get it towards the moon and we'll revisit it later as we attempt to uh, insert it into its orbit. And then we'll obviously also uh, deorbit and descend the Columbia and get it back down to the surface. And why don't we get ourselves over to uh, some of the main missions I really want to talk about in this particular episode. But before we get to the Corian and the RMD, I have a couple of things going on on Kerbin's atmosphere. The first here is Carol at the KSC. And inside the vehicle is our engineer, Wilman, and this is the Model K2. You actually saw me starting this mission last episode and then realizing that I had somehow foolishly removed the life support from this vehicle, which it does require, even though we are clearly not very far from home and still in Kerbin's atmosphere. And we're just going around collecting science from... Uh, biomes from which we've collected science many many times before but now I also have the gravioli detector so we're collecting science uh, with that as well trying to scrounge it I really need to start getting more science involved um, and you can see the wheels look at that right wheel I couldn't figure out what was going on with that the wheels are somewhat botched uh, or glitched up um, this seems to be a problem actually with since 1.1. I'm still working with version 1.1.2 by the way. Uh, I'd love to go to 1.1.3. Maybe that addresses these things. I don't know. Uh, it got me though quick saving on a fairly regular basis because I was having issues with the wheels. I have issues with crashing as well especially if I use Kerbal attachment system um, and also Connecting things up radially in the VAB was causing crashes, so I've gotten in the habit of doing a lot of quick saves, and that got me here. Uh, instead of quick saving, I ended up uh, recovering by mistake, <laughs> which actually by this point I was pretty bored with the whole thing anyway. So, uh, I mean, nuzzling up to these buildings is always a bit of a pain to get these little biomes that are in here by the buildings, and then Leah had to go out and collect all the science from the various pieces of equipment. And uh, what what what's the game clock say here? Oh my gosh, like 42 minutes. <laughs> I've been at this, so uh, I don't know. Maybe 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 it was my subconscious getting in there and saying enough is enough. And that led into another trivial mission that again I will not spend hardly any time with. This is a bit of uh, swatting a mosquito with a sledgehammer. I think this is the Otter Three, the Panther afterburner equipped otter 3 doing the short hop to the island airport for one of these anomaly hunter missions this is the third time i've done this mission i'm hoping that this will start spawning more missions it seems every time i upgrade the uh my kerbal space program to another version these missions seem to reset for some reason uh so we're here to do the mission we're also here equipped again with a gravioli detector <sighs> Graviolis. Mm. Anyway, and then uh, Valentina is going to go out there. She's going to visit the uh, pod that's here and go up the escape tower to complete the what's required for this particular contract. And oh, what the hell? What went on back there? Something exploded. Oh, <laughs> looks like one of the landing gears is down. Probably blew up. Did I mention I'm having issues with wheel glitches since 1.1? Uh, yeah, that's uh, par for the course. But it seems Bill's okay, so we just finished off this particular mission. It also seems like the engines are stuck on for some reason, too. Uh, well, let's check in on Junksat N plus 1, which we started this video with, which is now ready to do its orbital insertion around the moon. 
Ooh, a little bit unstable there. Every time I thrust, it seems to want to yaw a bit to the right. Oh, I'll just have to keep it under control and just do puffs like this. Um, the thrust is just being provided by linear RCS thrusters, so I don't have any con throttle control really. I can just, I, I'm just tapping H and if it gets too far off, I pull it back. Yeah, this is working. It ain't pretty, but it's working and that's all I care about. Should be getting pretty close. Come on. Looking at the contract window there, we're just waiting for it to go green. It's got to be close. There we go. Okay, good stuff. All right, so that one is done. Contract complete. Excellent. Let's go on and see how our crew from the Karain is doing. They are now zooming in for their first arrow braking pass. And the arrow braking pass itself went without any problems, though we are coming back from Minmus, so our orbit is a bit inclined. It's at an inclination of 9 degrees, and Kerbin Station is at an inclination of 0 in low Kerbin orbit. And you definitely want to make that change far away from Kerbin, where the inclination changes are cheaper. So the next time I was out, happened to be at the descending node out far away from Kerbin, I decided to make my inclination change out there. And that went no problem either. I got my inclination down to zero. Easy enough. I actually am comfortable as far as fuel goes. But then I recognize that I do have a bit of a problem. Once I checked when uh, the crime was due to be back in Kerbin's atmosphere, I noticed that it and the R&D will be arrow breaking within minutes of each other. I can't, I can't have that. I can't have arrow breaking happening both at the same time because I got to be with the active vehicle in order for the physics to work or else I'm in a bit of trouble. So uh, I had to make a little bit of adjustment with the Karayan. So I time warped out towards Apoapsis where I discovered that the moon was now in my way, <laughs> complicating the issues even further. Well, what I decided to do is I was just gonna burn myself, uh, do a little bit of prograde burning here and see if I can simultaneously, maybe the moon might help here a little bit, um, adjust when my periapsis with Kerbin is going to be. Still have it at a decent altitude inside Kerbin's atmosphere, which is appropriate for aero braking, and ended up uh, with this and still had a bit of a moon flyby. I mean, I'm right at the edge of the moon's sphere of influence, but... Uh, that's actually all right, because I got Chrisnik aboard. Chrisnik's never been in the moon's sphere of influence before, and a flyby is two experience points for him. And I think, with his orbit about Minmus, I think this actually uh, will get him to level two. So, so that'll be good. We'll see once we get him down to the surface if it actually works out that way. And uh, once I got out of the moon's sphere of influence and checked to make sure that my arrow breaking was still going to work all right with the Karayan 1, it was time to get to the R&D and uh, get that pass out of the way. Okay, here we go. Closing in on. So we're going to put this on to prograde. I've done this once before with a B-class asteroid. And it worked pretty well. Uh, despite my electricity failures, I had a failed battery, thanks to dang it with that one, you might recall. And the thing was tumbling out of control, but I did aero brake and get a capture. Now I have plenty of electricity. I think what I'll do is I'll put on both sets of these reaction wheels up here at the front to make sure I have the torque to hold that prograde vector. Uh, the, ba the solar panels don't seem to be collecting any charge, but... Nah, I got plenty of electricity to get through. It's not going to be an issue. So, uh, yeah, we're on prograde vector now, so let's time warp down to the atmosphere. Get this show on the road and get our capture. Recall that I do need to get this around Minmus. But we'll get our capture first. I don't think I have enough fuel to get me to Minmus, but that's okay. Okay, let's stop time warp. Uh, once, once this thing is captured in an orbit around Kerbin, it's pretty easy to go up and refuel it at our leisure, and then we can get it towards Minmus. All right, we are solidly on the prograde vector. We're just going to need to ride this through. 
And we'll hang on a sec. Whoa, uh, the thermal percentage on Kerbal Engine. Wow, okay, that was a solar panel. Now it's saying the battery is heating up really high. Wow, that is a lot of heat. I'm not even that deep in the atmosphere yet. It's in well into the 90s. I don't know what's going on. What, hang on. Whoa. Ah! Oh my gosh, it's it's like this thing, the whole rocket's heating up really badly. Oh! Wow! That asteroid didn't seem to... Wait, wait, wait. I can save this. I can save this. Wait. Uh, let's go back to the tracking station. Because, um... I think the asteroid is still okay. And if I can... I mean, obviously the, the RMB is gone. <laughs> but, but if I can get back on the asteroid and still ride it through... Hopefully, I can. I should be able to still get that capture, get the asteroid into an orbit, and then chase it down with something else, and hopefully be able to recover this thing. Okay. Whoa. Okay. That. Oh, there's little bits left, but obviously, uh, the RMD is just a string of debris right now. But I do have the asteroid, and the thing is, is um. If its periapsis doesn't drop too low, I think it's around 24, 25, it's nowhere the periapsis is going to get that low. Uh, if I don't make it the active vehicle, atmospheric physics won't act on it. It'll stay in orbit indefinitely. The only thing I need to get here is a capture. Wow. I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm honestly kind of perplexed on what happened there. I did the RMB and the asteroid behind a B-class asteroid acted as a very effective heat shield. You would think a D, much bigger D-class asteroid would even be better at being a heat shield. In previous campaigns, I've aerobraked asteroids a couple of times. I've never had that happen before. It, it was almost like the ship didn't have any kind of protection at all. Oh, man. Well, what I need... Oh, oh, there goes a camera change. That is encouraging. That feels like a capture. Okay, we still have a lot of arrow breaking to go. We are past periapsis. It's still hanging on. Uh, oh, we are starting to get less heating. You can hear the sound coming down. That's good. Maybe there was a change with how the asteroid and heating and stuff goes with 1.1. Okay, my periapsis is around 37 kilometers. That's well above the uh, level it needs to be at for this vessel, for this object to stay in orbit. My apoapsis is in the low 90s. Um, and I'm almost out of the atmosphere, so it's not going to get much lower than that. And unfortunately, I looked this up afterwards, um, Kerbin's sphere of influence is a little over 84 kilometers. So although Kerbal Engineer seems to think, and the camera seems to think I have a capture, Let's look out here. Yeah, here you can see I am due to leave Kerbin's sphere of influence. I don't know. Either I have a capture or I don't. And there's not much I can do about it right now. But I don't have really much time to mourn because the Karayan 1 was really hot on its heels coming into Kerbin's atmosphere as well. Thankfully, this was far less dramatic. And it got itself, its orbit down a little bit further, lost a little bit more speed. It should be getting to Kerbin Station pretty soon. And in fact, that's going to have to be for next episode because right now, oh uh, well, we need a vehicle to get these folks back down to the surface. Actually, I do have two Kerr users attached to Kerbin Station, each of which can bring three Kerbals back down to the surface, but the issue I keep having with the Kuryus is that it can only carry three Kerbals, and I'm perpetually having, because of the rescue missions, more Kerbals in space than I have the ability to bring back down. So uh, this particular vehicle can carry up to six Kerbals, though right now it's only carrying three. As you can see, it's got Stella and Shellcal and Carol aboard. Actually, shell cow was a bit of a mistake. I meant to have a pilot, a scientist, and an engineer, and you can look, I can ha I have two uh, scientists. Uh, I got shell cow and Chris Nick mixed up. Chris Nick is my engineer. He's the one that should be here. Actually, I got another vehicle that's going to be on its way up soon, next episode, to uh, help bring down that Mark II cockpit that the Karine is carrying in, so I can bring up some more Kerbals with that. 
we'll do a lot of crew shuffling and get kerbals that have been in space for a long time back down to the surface. Our orbiter, of course, is underneath that fairing. You'll be seeing it very, very soon. One other nice thing about this particular vehicle, as you can see, it has a single stage lifter. That's always kind of nice, cutting down on costs. I guess one hint as well is I'm using a little bit of Inferno Robotics. As you can see, I brought up that servo control. Okay, I, I, you know what? I think it's time to see what's underneath here. I got me a plane on a stick. Oops, it's, it's upside down. Let's roll this around so you can see it properly. And uh, I got some infernal robotic hinges. So let's fold out the wings. Come on. Oh, wait, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Ooh. Yeah, it's a very, very simple craft, as you can see. Very small, pretty lightweight. That's why I can get away with just the single booster lifter bringing it up. Oh, uh, let's put the lights on. And I do have a communitron I need to extend here because, again, there's a probe core in this booster, so I can deorbit it later. I'm calling this the Dream Chaser after Sierra Nevada's proposed, well, it's not proposed, I suppose, and NASA has funded it, and uh, they've got a contract, and they'll be building it, I'm pretty sure. Except theirs is not a crewed vehicle like this one is. Theirs is a autonomous cargo vehicle. And it's hardly a new idea, actually. Uh, the European Space Agency had the idea for the Hermes, that's what they called it. Oh, that goes back decades for a sort of space shuttle. Same idea, though, putting it on top of a booster like this, and, uh, of course, uh, earlier this year in May, India launched a little kind of mini space shuttle as well. Went suborbital and landed again. Same idea, plane on a stick. So it's, it's not a new idea, but it's a very efficient idea. It's a very, in Kerbal Space Program, it's pretty easy to build these kind of things. You don't have to stick them under fairings like I did. I just did it, I don't know, I thought it was easier. It will fly. There we go. We are in orbit. Okay, we will circularize. And then we'll get ready to detach our orbiter. This is a very simple craft. You can see it's most of it's made up of simply a Mark II cockpit and then the four-person crew cabin. It's got a little bit of monoprop. The only monoprop is um, in the cockpit. And then I added two of those cylindrical um, monoprop containers. And that's all the fuel it has. Uh, powering it are two of those puff puff uh, monopropellant engines. And that's it. And that's enough. That gives it about 250, a little more than that, I think, of Delta V. That's enough to get it up to the station, get it back. That's all I need it for. There we go. And it's got its docking port at the back end and the aforementioned puff puff engines are very, very small and fit radially and comfortably sit on either side of the docking port. I went with uh, Dream Chaser, didn't Kerbalize the name, uh, number one, because Cream Chaser to me just kind of uh, felt wrong. I wasn't going to call it the Cream Chaser. And uh, secondly, uh, I don't, there was a, a, a modder that made an actual Dream Chaser mod um, duplicating the idea. And the lawyers from Sierra Nevada said you must change it, and now it's called the Dreamer mod. Very cool little can, little plane. I, I don't use mods like that. I tend to like to build things from you know rather than these pre-built ones. But uh, that annoyed me so much. I hate when these sort of corporate types get in there, and they're it's so short-sighted. Like it's not like this modder is your competition, or <laughs> they're making money off of it. They're they're promoting your products. They're promoting your idea, and they have like you know, a, a, a beeline right for the, where your target fans are going to be, uh, just bugs me. So yes, this is the Dream Chaser. As you can see, we are just about to our berth here. I sort of wonder if I should put another docking node onto this station. This is feeling really crowded in around this middle part here. And these three, of course, will be joining Bartner and Bob, who are right now aboard the station. 
in addition to uh, the six aboard the Karayan 1 that will be coming this way. So this station is going to be crowded pretty quickly, but we'll be taking a lot of them down almost immediately. All right, almost there now. Turn off the reaction wheels. And we'll see how this all looks like. Boom, there we go. Let's zoom in here. This is looking all right. Ooh, it's a little tight. <laughs> that one control surface on the port wing. Pretty close to that monoprop kink. Yeah, maybe another docking node might not be a bad idea. And we'll be getting the Karayan 1 to this station next episode as well. We've got another vehicle coming up to bring down that Mark II cockpit to finish off Gilly's Rescue. But all of that's going to have to be for next episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time. <music>